Uh, well, it's, uh, it's good to be able to preach once in a while. I sure appreciate pastor's confidence in me. And um, you know, it's good to you know, have a Bible that we can not worry about whether it's right or not. We know it's so. Uh, if you could open your Bible to uh, Ecclesiastes, chapter number 8. Chapter number 8. And I'll just read one verse there. Uh, Psalms and Proverbs and then Ecclesiastes. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Number 8. <clears throat> okay, and I'm going to read... Uh, uh, I'll read verse 1 to 5. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 1 to 5. You follow along as I read it. Uh, who is as a wise man and who knoweth the interpretation of a thing? A man's wisdom maketh his face to shine and the boldness of his face shall be changed. I counsel thee to keep the king's commandment and that in regard of the oath of God. Be not hasty to go out of his sight. Stand not in an evil thing for he doeth whatsoever pleaseth him. Where the word of a king is, there is power, and who may say unto him, What doest thou? Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing, and a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Uh, let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege again of standing behind a pulpit. And Oh, Lord, we don't take this lightly. This is, uh, <laughs> um, Father, this, the, the, the truth is dispensed from here. And Father, I pray that I would not be an exception to that, that you direct what I say, Lord, and, and I just pray you'd bless this message to your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, let's see now, the, the, this, I, this book of Ecclesiastes, is a, it's a strange book. It's a good book, but it's a strange book. Um, it's a good book, and it's, the, it's written by a man, Solomon, who, who was at this time, had been king for just about 40 years. For almost four decades, this man, he... Uh, <laughs> He ruled an entire nation. This was prior to the nation being divided between the north and the south. And, and uh, as all kings at that time, he ruled with decree. That is, he didn't depend on anybody to vote. He didn't depend on anyone to, um, whether there was an election coming up and whether he had to do something to make people happy before they, he, he, he wasn't interested in that. What he said went. He ruled with impunity. That means that when he made a decision, he, he, there was no consequences to him. And so really, you talk about power. And, um, and you know, he, uh, he, he loved his people. And I think if you check over there, the Queen of Sheba, when she came up there, she said, uh, she said this man's servants are happy in the half that hasn't been told to me how wonderful this nation is. You know some that I just got to throw this in for free. You know, a king that loved his people and trusted them, he wouldn't feel threatened by them. That, that was just because it's like, these are my people. And they look at him and say, we love our king. Um, and because of that, he'd never think of disarming them. He'd never think of, and I'm just throwing this kind of in for free. <laughs> no, I'm just, I, I got to say this because this is just part of the message here. Um, well, it's kind of part. Um, I take, hold on to Ecclesiastes. Take a look there in 1 Samuel chapter 13. You know, in the Bible, the only first Samuel, first sex Samuel, first Samuel chapter thirteen, the only people that were interested in disarming someone was the enemy. But they, they, it wasn't your own people. Look at first Samuel chapter thirteen. This is um, now look there in verse number nineteen. First Samuel thirteen verse nineteen. Now there was no smith. That would, we'd call that a blacksmith. There was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines, those are the ones that have the enemy, said, lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. I look down there and um, uh, verse number 20. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his share and his coulter and his ox and his mattock. And, and, and so again, the, the enemy didn't want these people armed. That's the enemy. So when someone says, we, want, we don't want you armed, I worked with a man from China a couple of years ago, and the fellow said that in China, I'm just telling you what he told me, he said, when you have a butcher shop, you have a meat cleaver, and that meat cleaver, by law, has to be chained to the table that it's used on. You say, why is that? Government doesn't trust its people. See, that, that's just, and nonetheless, get back to Ecclesiastes chapter 8. Um, so here's a king who writes this book, and of course, inspired by the Holy Spirit, he writes this book, and uh, after almost 40 years on the throne, 
And he's experienced a life of trying to satisfy himself in more ways than we can imagine. He had the, he had the, the means. Um, he, after, by the time he gets through 11 chapters, at the very last chapter, he acknowledges, you know what? You can have whatever you want, you can do whatever you want, but anything short of obeying God, you've wasted your life. That was his conclusion. And it's still the conclusion. Um, uh, and, and this is, a, he calls a life that's lived without obeying God, he calls that vanity. This here is a strange book, because if you wanted to build a cozy little doctrine that suits you and your opinion, this would be the book to go to. Um, of course, if you'd have to exclude a good portion of the rest of the Bible, but you would satisfy your, your want for now. For example, suppose I wanted to live my life, and I, I, I just wanted to live it up, uh, I wanted to live at Burger King, McDonald's, Pizza Hut. I just wanted to eat, drink, and be merry and just say, that's it. If I, if I said, you know what, that's, that's what I want to do, and I'm looking through the Bible, I could prove that from this book. Take you're in Acts, or Ecclesiastes 8, look at verse number 15. Then I commended mirth, because a man hath no better thing under the sun than to eat and to drink and be merry. You see that? It's in the Bible. Just live it up, man. Now, you're going to have to exclude a good portion of the rest of the Bible to back it up. But if you wanted to pull something out of context, that would be the place to do it. I suppose I heard some guy maybe on the radio, on the street, in church somewhere. And I heard the guy preach that Jesus died for your sins. And if you trust him as your savior and receive what he did at Calvary, he'll take you to heaven one day. On the other hand, if you think you can make it on your own, you're going to wind up paying for your sins in a lake of fire. That's just, that's a, that's a truth from the Bible. And I think to myself, man, I, I don't want to have nothing to do with that lake of fire. But I don't want to receive Christ as my savior. I don't want, so what do I do? Well, if I could get rid of that hell thing, if I could push that to the side, I want to do that, this is the book to do it. Look, I'll show, this is Je Jehovah's Witness' favorite passage. or two of them. Chapter 9 and verse number uh, 5. The Bible says, for the living know, chapter 9, verse 5, the living know that they, that they shall die, but the dead know not anything, neither have they any more reward, for the memory of them is forgotten. You see that? You die, you're done. That's, it. That's what a JW teach. That, that's a great verse for them. They, you have to exclude what Jesus and John and Peter and James said about a lake of fire. You have to exclude all that stuff about uh, eternal torment and all the rest of that that is taught in the Bible, but if you seclude this verse, you can teach that. It has nothing to do with truth, but that's where you say, what's that all about? Well, look at the verse. It says, verse 5, for the living know not that they shall die, or the living know that they shall die, but the dead know not anything. When a guy dies, that's true. He's, he's now, when you look at him, there's the body, and it says, they know not anything, neither have they any more reward. Well, listen. If you work for a company and the company said, we're going to give you a Rolex watch at the end of 20 years, and Frank works for the company for 18 years and then he dies and they take him out to the cemetery, they have the funeral. Two years later, the boss, he's going, Frank would have been here for 20 years, right? And the secretary says, yes, sir, uh, but Mr. Jones, he would have been here for 20 years. Why don't we give him a watch? And she said, <laughs> Mr. Jones, he's dead. Yeah, no, no, here. And he takes off, well, takes this Rolex and go out to the cemetery. You say, that's foolishness. Sure it is. That's why the verse, look at the middle of it, neither have they any more reward. You can't, you can't reward a dead person. He, the, the, Paul, Solomon's looking at it from his perspective where he's dead. We can't, the only thing close to that is if you get a, uh, in, there's a war and some guy does some heroic deed and he dies, they'll call that, they'll give the guy an award and it's called posthumously. That means he's dead. It's not like the guy gets out of the casket and says, I just want to thank you. No, no, he's dead. And they say that body right there, when it was alive, it did this and this were, that's, that's it. But to say that there's no payment for sins after dying, you're stretching a bit. You've got to exclude some things. They're, they're, you say, well, we can't do that. Well, no build, not build a, can't build up a, a doctrine, no hell, verse 5. Try, try again. Go to verse 10. Verse 10, please ask 9, verse 10. Whosoever, uh, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave whither thou goest. 
You see that? So I guess when somebody dies, they're just burnt up or they're, they're, they're done, according to that verse. Well, look what the verse says. It says, whosoever they find, uh, who, whatsoever they find, hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. That is, while you're alive. For there is no work, no device, no knowledge, no wisdom in the grave with the ghost. Uh, let me put it this way. Suppose I, I'm no good at arguing. I can't argue with nothing. And my wife, she all wins. Just, <laughs> just leave it there. But suppose I, I don't know how to argue, and I'm mumbling to some guy, and I'm saying, maybe to Brother Cam, and I'm saying, man, I wish I could argue. I wish I could leave I get, get, could get in the last word. I wish somebody, I wish when I argued, I could be some, like some people and just leave them speechless where they, they're done. And Cam says, well, I'll tell you what, brother, come with me. I can solve your problem. And I say, okay. And he takes me outside and we get in his truck. And I say, where are we going? He says, going to the cemetery. What are we going there for? He said, because, because you can now get in the last word because there's no wisdom. You can now say what you want. You, you, it's done. That's what that verse is talking about. That, you know, there, how many people here, your parents are gone or some buddy of yours, and you're going, man, I think of Brother Shepley. Oh, man, he used to come here. He's in heaven now. That guy, I've been at work oftentimes, and I got an electrical issue, and I think to myself, man, I wish Brother Shepley was here. He'd solve this problem. But there's no wisdom in the grave. He's not here. He can't give me that, see? But to build a doctrine off that saying there's no hell, nuts, nuts. Yeah, anyhow, the book of Ecclesiastes, this is it. Um, so if you wanted to build something, that would be the thing. Um, now, I've said all that to, 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 so that you would recognize the fact that this book is written by a king who knows more about life, knew more about life than anyone else. He had the means, he had the money, he had all that. Um, if, I, if, if, if I'm talking to somebody who's thinking to themselves, man, if I had the money, if I had the money to buy this vehicle or that property, I'd be happy. I'd have it made in the shade. Well, you, you might convince someone else. You might convince me. But you wouldn't convince Solomon. You know why? Because he had all the money. He, if you took all the gold that's mentioned in the Bible that Solomon had, the buildings he made with gold, and you took that gold today and put it alongside the the, 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 the total amount of any five billionaires in the world, they would look like paupers. He had the goods, man. You say, well, um, right now, do you think he would know something about that alongside the guy that says, if I just have, you know what he said about a man has all money? He says, it's vanity. It's worthless. Um, if I'm talking to somebody who's thinking, you know, I've been married to this woman for, for a few years, and I'll tell you, I wish I could, you know, if I, if I just dump her and grab that one or maybe have a little fling on the side with some girl I, man that would I would do you know this man here this man had a thousand wives a thousand you reckon he knew something about women do you know what he said <laughs> he said uh, he that findeth a wife findeth a good thing and obtaineth favor of the Lord he said, if you find a wife singular, you got a good thing going there, man. You better hold on. Uh, he said, rejoice with the wife of thy youth. <laughs> he said that, that houses and riches are for fathers, but a prudent wife is from the Lord. He said, you better appreciate her. You say, yeah, but I thought, I saw a movie one time. Listen, you think, who, who would know more? A man that had a thousand wives? Or some bozo that's strung out in cocaine trying to impress people pretending to be someone else? That man knew what he was talking about. And, uh, and I say, he said, you know what? As a matter of fact, look, chapter 9, verse number 9. It says, live joyfully with the wife whom thou lovest all the days of thy life, thy bondage. <laughs> Listen, you know what? Just enjoy her, man. Enjoy. Um, I suppose I'm talking to somebody who's thinking to themselves, man, you know, I got a buddy. This guy lives in, I don't know, Toronto, BC. And, and th this fellow is telling me that there's pleasures and there's satisfaction in the lights of the far country over there. And he's... <laughs> And it just sounds like this narrow life living for Jesus is really, we don't know what we're talking about. Because according to him, he's, um, again, this man Solomon was a king who could operate with impunity, no repercussions. He had all the money, all the means, he could travel, he could do whatever he want. And when he said that a life that's lived without obeying God is vanity, who do you think knows better? Him or your buddy that's, who has to show up at mom's place to get a meal every couple days and dad helps with the rent? Who do you, th I'm telling you, this book is amazing. All right, so I'm saying all that. Back, back there at Ecclesiastes chapter 8, 
And um, I would just want to take, I'm saying that to say that I'm not taking a verse out of context. I'm saying that to say that this book you can learn a lot from, but you've got to be careful. Um, it, look at verse number 5, Acts 8, 5. And the Bible says, Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing. That is, you have a clean conscience if you obey the king. Shall feel no evil king. And a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Now it says a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. And I'm going to this evening just pull out the phrase, a wise man's heart discerneth time. We're going to look at judgment another time, another message. But this here, a wise man's heart will discern time. So that is, according to God, if someone's wise, they'll be able to differentiate or recognize things that someone who is not wise won't be able to differentiate or recognize. You see, it, it, this, is, this is somebody that wa is walking into something, and if he's wise, he'll go, we're approaching something that I have to do here or not do, or I, I have to change what I'm doing because I'm now entering a certain time, and this is a wise man. Um, and <laughs> I'm going to interject my opinion right here, so you can take all this and park it in file 13. Just This is kind of the, the, the introduction. I haven't got to the message, but I want to I say some things, and it's going to help with the message. Um, we're done for a little bit. With, we're done with Ecclesiastes, but we're going to look at a wise man's heart discerneth time. Look at Matthew chapter number, uh, Matthew chapter 16. Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is speaking to these Pharisees, and he's speaking to them, and he says, uh, look there in verse number, uh, verse 1, I guess, Matthew 16, uh, verse number 1. It says, uh, the Pharisees also um, with the Sadducees came, and tempting him, desired that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky, but, you can, you, you, but can you not discern the signs of the times? And so what he's saying is he's, he's rebuking them because he's saying, you guys, that's where that expression, red sky at night, sailors delight, red sky come morning, sailor take warning. That's where that comes from. And, uh, but, and Jesus is saying, you guys can, be, you can, you can look up at the sun and go, oh, yeah, yeah it's, it's red tonight, so it'll be a nice day tomorrow. You can figure that out, but you don't know your Bible at all. You, 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 you have no idea when it comes to the times how things are changing spiritually. You're blind in that regard. And, uh, but you know something? I want to say you ought to give credit at least to the Pharisees because they could discern the, time, the, the, the weather. There is a lot of, I see people wearing shorts when it's minus 20. And I'm thinking, Pharisees are smarter than you guys because you, you just, <laughs> and, and there's something about that that says, now, and this is what I think. And again, I'm just throwing my opinion in there. Um, I'm walking across this yard one day and this guy's backing up a pickup to hook onto a trailer. And, um, and I say, um, I didn't say nothing. I ran over and I said, I'm going like this. I'm guiding him. And he waves to me and I wave back and I'm thinking, he's just thanking me. And I'm guiding, and he waves, and I, he wants me, I said, what? He says, you don't have to guide me. I say, why? He says, I got a camera. I don't need you. You don't, oh, okay. So you don't, oh, that's fine. So I walk away, and, and a little while later, um, Brother Lone, I hate to pick on your big, <laughs> Brother Lone and I are driving in Winnipeg. And, uh, and he says, you want to drive? I said, well, sure, this is a cool vehicle, man, fanciest. I mean, you know, I got diesel, manual transmission, suspension like a tank happy <laughs> but I'm driving this fancy vehicle I'm sitting in this like Mr. Know-it-all and I'm driving along and all of a sudden this light shows up on the side I say brother there's something wrong <laughs> you got a light going and he saw that that light that that thing it tells you there's somebody in your blind spot well, sure enough, that's, that's, that's amazing, man. And, and so we're driving along, and, uh, and I got it on cruise, and I'm catching up to this semi, and uh, catching up to the semi, and I'm catching up, and I look at him and say, man, I hate guys like that. They pick up speed when you start catching up to them. And he says, no, no. he says, the cruise, it, it's the, oh, that's, that's, yeah, he said, you can bypass it. Oh, okay, I don't have to do that. And so we pass this semi, and we're driving along, and I'm doing like you normally do when you drive. I'm looking, I'm going, that guy's combine, look at that, canola's down, and I'm watching all the crops, and all of a sudden the steering wheel starts to vibrate. And I'm thinking, what a cheap, I didn't tell him, but, but what in the world? And he says, well, that's because you crossed the line over here. I said, oh, okay, so, I, and I'm, I'm just, this, just again, this is just my opinion. You can park this somewhere, but um, 
that there's, so I don't have to look at the blind spot. I don't have to worry about catching up to a truck and hitting them. I don't have to worry about going off the road. I, I am at the shop the other day, and I had a part, and I put it on the counter, and this guy comes, and he's looking at it, and I say, you think you can fix it? Uh, and all of a sudden, this voice says, answer your phone. And, uh, and I'm looking around and said, answer your phone. And I said, you better answer your phone. And the guy said, well, yeah, that's my voice. And he pulls his phone. And this is my take, okay? I'm just my opinion, though. I know I'm supposed to say this is all neat. But there's some pessimistic thing in me that says, we are so told what to do, and we've got all these guards in place that we've kind of got complacent where we don't have to think too much anymore. So we just kind of wander along and oh, it'll tell me, it'll tell, it'll, don't know, that buzzer will go off. And, uh, and I'm saying that, you know, spiritually, we do the same thing. We have got so spoiled, we get into a routine, come to church, take the Bible, take the hymn book, and we constantly do that. And we're going to have to remember our Lord's assessment of Christianity just before he came back. You don't have to turn to it. But he said over there in Revelation 3, 17 to 18, he said, because thou sayest, talking to believers just before he comes back, he says, because thou sayest, I'm rich, increased with goods, have need of nothing. Knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable, poor, blind and naked. And he gives some counsel. He says, I counsel thee to buy me gold tried in the fire, that thou mayest be rich. Let's get some deity, get some God in you. And white raiment, that thou mayest be clothed. Get some righteous living in you. That the shame of thy nakedness do not appear. And anoint thine eyes with eyes salve, that thou mayest see. And is it not surprising that many a believer today, they, they just blunder along and they don't recognize that, man, I'm getting into a situation I shouldn't be. Because we got it all, man. What do I need God for? Really, I'm saved, I'm going to heaven. Well, all that said... I'm going to start message here. In Ecclesiastes chapter 8, verse 5, I've taken that verse. A wise man, a wise man's heart discerneth time. I want to preach a message to you this evening called sometimes to discern. That's sometimes to recognize I'm going into it. I better start reacting somehow. Okay, here's the first one. Look at Mark chapter 6 and verse 48. Mark chapter 6 and verse number 48. Here's the disciples. They're in a boat. And Jesus isn't there. Mark chapter 6 and verse number 48. It says, uh, it says, and he, Jesus, saw them, the disciples in the boat, toiling and rowing. Okay, so they're, they're this, for the wind was contrary unto them. And about the fourth watch of the night, he, Jesus, cometh unto them, walking upon the sea and would have passed by them. So here's what's happening. These disciples are in this boat, and they want to go that way, but the wind is going that way. That means it's against them. They want to go, so what they have, to, a sailboat, it'd be beautiful. They could just put, hoist the sail, but the wind's going contrary. They want to go that way. The wind is going that way. They pick up the row oars and they start to row. I want you to notice something else. Not only are they rowing and the wind was contrary, but it's about the fourth watch of the night. That's the last watch before Jesus comes back. Now, I, now, with that, so there they row. First time, that when it comes to times to discern, is a time to row. Take, now you're done with Mark. Look at Ephesians chapter number 4. Ephesians chapter 4. The Bible says, makes it clear, that a local church is the way that, uh, that uh, a Christian can grow. And within a local church, you have leadership, and you have preaching, and you have supporting of missionaries, and you have collective prayer for the brethren and for missionaries, and you have all this... And verse number 12, Ephesians 4.12, it says there, for the perfection of the saints, that's to build them up. At the end of the verse, for the edifying of the body of Christ, that's to build them up. Uh, verse number 13, it says, till we come to the unity of the faith. So we're still building up. Um, look at verse number 14. That we, henceforth, be no more children. That is, we're not carnal, spiritual babies. We're not, no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. Now, uh, in the same way those disciples are rowing because the winds were contrary just before Jesus comes back, spiritually, there are times when you and I enter into times where if we're wise, we'll recognize, hey man, I better start to row. 
because there's some doctrine that's starting to blow me off course here. And um, there is a, the, the Bible says, before the Lord comes back, it says, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, they shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. Um, there is a spirit of apathy that has embedded itself within the ranks of Christianity. Where to the point where to fight, to wage war, engage the enemy is almost considered a, a rebellious type attitude. So the ship that's carrying the bride of Christ is slamming on the rocks of the world, out of control in the whirlpool of Hollywood, grounding on the sandbar of sensuality, and tossing in the breakers of indifference. And it's high time that some of those people in that boat picked up some oars and rowed, and recognized that you better be careful, you better be careful when some winds of doctrine that's not sound start blowing you off course. And you're going to have to say, hey, I better start doing something or I'm going to get taken out where I shouldn't be. And, um, for example, the false doctrine that looking at, looking at a screen at home is the same as being in an assembly of people singing hymns and hearing preaching and supporting missionaries and praying for one another. That's, that's the, this idea of whatever works for you, that's, that's not true. I just, can, can I just ask something? Can somebody give me a phone? I'm not going to use it. Don't worry, I don't even know how to turn it on. Just, just come on, everybody's got them. Just, I, this is so profound. So profound. But... <laughs> Well, you learn something. Then. See this thing right here? That's not a church. That's just a device. That's one of those things where Ecclesiastes said there's no device in the grave. There's none of these in the grave. <laughs> but this thing here, it's, 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 it's not a church. There, there, this thing is not a church. You can sit at home and watch that thing or hook it up, have a bigger screen, and you can watch some guy who's sitting in the garden, he's sitting on the veranda, he's got a suit, he's got a Bible, but you don't know that guy. His wife might be in, in, in the other kitchen crying with two black eyes. He might have bills piling up, the collectors keep quiet. You have no idea about that guy. And you think by sitting at home going like this somehow, yeah, I'm always watching preaching. You better know what you're watching, because somebody's going to slip into you some... Uh... Thank you, brother. <laughs> Ooh. Okay, uh, so I, again, I'm saying better care. The false doctrine that says the church is going to go through the tribulation. Somebody's trying, you're going to have to pick that thing up and roll. You're going to have to make sure. The false doctrine that God is through with the nation of Israel. It's not true. He's not, we can't just pick those. That because the nation of Israel isn't serving God and loving God now, that doesn't mean we say, well, it's done with them. I guess we can go out, grab whatever promise. No, 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 no. That's not true. You're going to have to row when that thing comes up. The false doctrine that God has no expectations of a believer once they're saved is only tolerated because it coddles spiritual babies. And people think, well, I'm saved. What more do you want? Um, you say, but if I started to row or stand, I wouldn't be very liked by even some other Christians. Let me give you a couple of quotes. Here's one of the greatest prime ministers England ever, England ever had said this, if you set out to be liked, you would be prepared to compromise on anything at any time and you would achieve nothing. That was Margaret Thatcher. She, <laughs> um, they called her the Iron Lady. They asked her one time, <laughs> the, they, they said, would you uh, consider joining up with the European Union, like just getting, kind of be a part of, and instead of saying, well, you know, there are certain benefits to going that way. We'll have to, you know, set out and inquire to see what the, the benefit... You know, you know what her answer was? This is the quote. No, 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 never. <laughs> it's kind of like she, was, she knew what she was talking about. And, you know, people give Ronald Reagan credit because they say, well, the Iron Curtain came down thanks to him. He had a woman over in England that had that Union Jack flopping with a lot of pride that helped Reagan big time. And anyhow, so that was she, this is what our Savior said. Woe unto you, and all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers, the false prophets. You better be careful when, when people say, yeah, I'm just trying to build relationships with them, just trying to get, and everybody's one big happy, listen, man, you better be careful, because there might be a time in there you're going to have to pick up the oar and say, it's time to roll. Um, you know, I'm not saying it's right to be argumentative in every comment we disagree with, but don't be gullible or passive if the winds of false doctrine start pushing you or your family or church. You might have to roll. Incidentally, if you're still in Ephesians chapter 4, look how you ought to respi respond to those false winds of false doctrine. Look at verse 15, Ephesians 15, 4, 4 verse 15. But speaking the truth in love. You see, that, that's not grabbing them by the ears. That's kindly showing. Let me show what the Bible says. That's, okay, so the first one, time to roll. Speaking of a wise man's heart discerneth time. 
Uh, second one, look at Ruth chapter 3. Ruth chapter 3. So if you have uh, it goes Deuteronomy and Joshua and Judges and then Ruth. Uh, Ruth. Now you know the story. This man Elimelech goes down to Moab and he goes down there from Israel. And, uh, and then he dies and his boys die. And then one of his boys were married to a woman by the name of Ruth. And, and she comes back to, to Bethlehem, Judah, and Israel. And um, <clears throat> Naomi does, and uh, Naomi, the, the, the wife of Elimelech, and Ruth, the, the wife of one of Elimelech's sons, and they come back, and, um, and God providentially puts Ruth in the, in the field of a man by the name of Boaz, and she's getting barley from there for food. And um, under the Jewish economy in the Old Testament, if someone was impoverished or they died, the, the nearest relative or the nearest kinsman was obligated to purchase the land so that the land wouldn't go waste. And in this case, there is a woman, and he was obligated to carry the seed of Elimelech on, or it would stop. And so um, Boaz, uh, look at chapter 4. Chapter 4, and verse number... Uh, one, it says, Then went Boaz up to the gate and sat him down there, and behold, the kinsman whom Boaz spake came by, unto whom he, Boaz, said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. And so uh, Boaz stops us. Now, I, <laughs> I don't know how you read the Bible, but there's something here that just, I, I read this, and every time I read it, I know nothing about music, but I think, I think the word crescendo steps in here somewhere. It's like the is that? I don't know if this is the right thing. This is where the story is going along, and all of a sudden it just it goes up. And it's it, there. Look at verse number, chapter three, verse seventeen. It says, "This Ruth, and she Ruth said, she's talking to Naomi. These six measures of barley gave he Boaz to me, for he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law." <laughs> verse eighteen. Then said she, this is the mother-in-law, sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fall, for the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. And it's like, this thing is just going. And you read between the lines that it's like, Boaz is in love with this woman. It doesn't say it, but it's, and, and she, and, and Ruth, and, and Naomi knows what's going on. And I think, I'm just, <laughs> I think in the originals, this would have, Boaz comes up to this man, he says, oh, such one, turn aside, sit down hither. And the man comes along and, and Boaz says, hey, listen, you know, you know that, that, that there's a bunch of weedy, arid, non-growing land that's filled with alkali, and there, the, it, the, Elimelech died, and it's up to you to buy it, and that outlandish woman from Moab comes part of the package deal. You in on it? Hmm? <laughs> and the guy goes, no, I can't do that, man. I'm going to mar my inheritance. And uh, Boaz says, sign right here. And as soon as he signs, man, he's doing cartwheels. That's, if you don't get that, you're not reading your Bible too close. But that's what happens. And, but anyhow, I want you to know in the middle of chapter 4, verse number 1, that thing said, Boaz says, ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he gives him the, he, the, the second thing is a time to ho. First one, time to row, this one, time to ho. You know what this is? This is a time where a wise man will discern that there is somebody that doesn't know of a decision they have to make. And this man steps up and says, listen, you're approaching a fork here. You can go that way or that way, and you might not know it, but you need to know you'd be wise going that way. This is the time to hold. Um, uh, this, uh, i give you an illustration. This, when I, was, I got saved when I was 14, when I was 15, uh, I was at home, it was in the wintertime, and the phone rang in the house, and, uh, and back when there was just one phone in the middle of the house, there was usually a stampede to get to the phone, and when whoever got it, my mom always, she got that thing, she grabbed that, and she said, oh, and I didn't even bother coming to the phone, and she said, uh, just a minute, Jerry, it's for you, and uh, for me, nobody phoned, so I walk, hello, and, um, and this, uh, the voice said, uh, Jerry, I'll be there in 20 minutes, click, who was it? I don't know. And so uh, I'm, I'm, I go to the living room window and I'm looking out at the road. And there's nobody. Could. A little while later, somebody says, "Oh, there's a car outside." And it was gravel road. The guy didn't come into the uh, into our yard. So I put on my coat and scarf and stuff. And I go out, and a couple dogs come with me. And I go out, and there's this big 1970s, like I don't know what kind of, but long cars. He's parked there. 
And I go and I sit in the passenger seat, and the man in that seat, his name was Del Fulford. He was a deacon from the church where I got saved. That man sat down, and I sat down, and he told me, he said, you know something, young man? He said, I've been noticing the course you're taking. And you're trying, you keep going that way. Can I give you some advice? You ought to start going. And that guy, you know what that was? That was a time to hold. He grabbed me verbally and said, listen, you're, I see where you've going. Just like Boaz said, I see, you've got a decision to make here. You're going to make that decision? And I think that, that uh, a wise man will discern that. Every now and then, somebody will come to me and they'll say, uh, they'll say you know, I took so-and-so out for coffee because I just had, and I think to myself, praise the Lord, man. Somebody loves somebody enough to say, listen, I'm not going to just stand by and watch that guy go down the back alley of life. I'm going to try to, that's the time to hold. But a wise man will recognize that. A wise man will do that. Um, I think Jesus, when he was with Peter there in the, on the, uh, after the resurrection, and he, you know, they were sitting around eating fish on the beach, and, and Jesus, he, uh, he tells Peter, he says, uh, let's go for a walk. And they go for a walk, and Jesus says, uh, Peter, you, you know what happened back there in the, in the garden? I got arrested. Yeah, yeah, I know, Lord. And you know how you, know how you sat in that, that, by that fire and with all those people, and they didn't care. They were happy. I was ready. Yeah, I, I know, Lord. You, you have to go into this? Yeah, I do. Because I'm going to heaven pretty soon, and you're going to have to stand on your own. And if you don't, he, we're going to run into problems because we can't count. You're going to affect so many people, Pete. Do you love me? Yeah, I love you, Lord. I, you know I love you. Well, you're going to have to feed my sheep. That means you don't be good one day, bad the next day. You're good. That was a time to hold. And I say, a wise man, he'll, he'll recognize those times. Um, uh, so there's a time to row. There's a time to hold. Um, all right, last, no, this is the last one, second last one. Uh, look at 1 Samuel chapter 6. Here's the next one. So you've got a time to row. There's a time to hoe, and there's time to 1 Samuel. That's actually the next book. 1 Samuel chapter number 6. 1 Samuel 6. And here's what's happening here. Here's the uh, Philistines have got a victory over Israel. Not only a victory by killing a bunch of uh, is, Israeli soldiers, but they... Um, the Philistines have taken the Ark of the Lord away, and, uh, and the curse of God comes on that land. And these people, they, 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 they realize, you know what, maybe God, the God of Israel is doing this to us. And we're going to have to um, uh, see if we can get this Ark out of here, because it keeps uh, giving us major issues. Look at there, 1 Samuel 6 and verse number 7. This is what the advice was. Now, therefore, make a new cart, take two milk kine, that's milk cows, on which there hath come no yoke, and tie the kind to the cart, and bring the calves from home, uh, bring their calves home from them. And, uh, and the idea was, we're going to take these milk cows, never been hooked up before, we'll hook them up to this cart, we'll put the ark on it, and the thinking was, if those cows go that way, and they don't come back to their calves, it's got to be a god. But if they come back to, to the calves, then I guess that's just coincidence. And anybody that knows basic things about cattle knows that if you want to get the, the cow into the pen, into the barn, into the chute, take the calf, if she's got one, and you take that, and that cow will more than likely follow you. So it would be abnormal for these cows to go that way if their calves were back here bawling. They, they wouldn't do that. Well, look what the cows do. Verse number 12. And, uh, 1 Samuel 6, verse 12. And the kind took the straight way of Beshemesh and went along the highway. They're going in the right direction, lowing as they went and turned aside. Uh, sorry, I missed a word there. And turned not aside to the right hand or to the left. And so what happens is, this is the time to low. That is, uh, they realize that I'm going God's, I'm sorry for the illustration, but it's their cows. But they're going God's direction. And in cow language, the lowing means, I love you calves, I know you're mine, but I'm going God's way. You stay there if you choose, but this is the way I'm going. This is the, this is the, uh, this is the time to low. Uh, you say everybody, no, no normal person would, listen, Lot's wife was going God's way out of Sodom when it was burning. And she thought, but my sweethearts, it cost her her life. David the king had a rebellious son, Absalom, 
And instead of treating him like a rebel, he said, yeah, but that's my son. And it cost them a civil war. I'm saying that, um, I'm saying that uh, if you have family, listen, John Mark quit on Paul and Barnabas. And Barnabas said, listen, he's my nephew. It cost him a ministry. It, 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 I'm saying if, if, if you're going God's way, keep going God's way. I'm not saying that take a Bible and use the coffee table as a pulpit and point fingers and preach. I'm not saying that. And, I, and that's the right, that wouldn't be right. But don't go the other way where, you know, I'll just, if they start listening to that junk on the radio, then I'll listen to it too because I just, you keep going God's way. Keep going God. Just because they stop reading the Bible, don't say, well, I'll just have my devotions at another time so I won't upset them. If they don't attend church, don't stay at home to accommodate them. If you're visiting at them, say, listen, I'll get a taxi. I'm going to, I'm going, yes, I love you, but I'm going God's way. And that's, that's a time to low. I'm sure that Ruth, she came out of Moab. I'm sure she was somebody's aunt, somebody's niece, granddaughter, sister, friend. And there were probably a few people saying, come on, we grew up together. Come on, remember the good times we had? Come on, what, don't go to Israel. You think Ruth regretted that? She stayed the course. She went. I say sometimes a wise man will discern when there's a time below. And there are times like that. Um, finally, last one is, uh, uh, let's see, turn to uh, Revelation chapter 22. Revelation 22. And um, uh, let's see. We see at this time of year, we see there's, there's lights all of a sudden show up on houses. They show up on trees, on floats and parades. We see little manger scenes in front of the houses and all that stuff. We see trees with lights on them. And you realize, I guess Christmas is coming. Christmas is getting closer because apparently everybody's got all this stuff on there. And uh, you know, the Bible tells us that there'll be plenty of reminders when Jesus comes back. And, um, you know, this last one is when it's a time to go. It, it's one of these days, we're, we're, we're out of here. And um, the Bible says this. It says in 2 Timothy, you know, and turn there, 2 Timothy 3, verse 1 to 5, it says, This know also, that in the last days perilous times shall come. That's before the Lord comes back. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Um, we're there. Covetous, think Amazon and eBay. Boasters, think here's a picture of everything. This is what I did, bought, shot, done, went, all the rest of that stuff. Proud, blasphemers, disobedient parents. When I was coming up, I used to have that pointed out all the time. <laughs> uh, you listen, folks, it was pretty good 40 years ago. Uh, disobedient parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent. Incident incontinent that means like a like no restraint with a strong emphasis on on sexual no restraint we've seen that fierce despisers those that are good listen all those things showing up those are the, like the lights and the houses and the trees it's like there's a sign or something it, it's coming it's coming and we're out of here now take a look there and uh, now before I say it you ever been you ever have a test where or a test or an exam where you're given so much time to write it. And at the end of it, somebody says, that's it, put the pens down. And somebody says, well, I'm just on my last question, pens down. Yeah, but I just got one more, pens down. It's finished. It's, and so look there in Revelation chapter 22 and verse number 11. Uh, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He which is filthy, let him be filthy still. He that is righteous, let him be righteous still. He that is holy, let him be holy still. That is, when, when the Lord says it's finished, it's going to be too late to start going, you know, Lord, I'm going to start. No, no, it's done. It's finished. Yeah, well, I thought I just, well, once I got this age, I was, one time I was running up north, coming down from somewhere up north, and uh, I was coming by Devil's Lake, so that's like, I don't know, an hour this side of Grand Rapids. And it was summertime, and the, uh, the, the rained about 7 o'clock. The sun was up. There's water in the ditch, and I see a vehicle right in that water, and another vehicle stopped inside the road, and I'm thinking, oh, boy, something happened here. So I pull over, and I walk back there, and there's this Jeep had turned over, but now it was on all four wheels. So it's covered in mud, but it's sitting there. 
And there off to the side were two children about this side, and the people that stopped, I think they had blankets or something on, and the kids were standing there, and it was morning, kind of chilly. And there was a woman standing, the driver, she was standing uh, looking at this, and I come along like an idiot, and I thought, oh, I'll, just, I'll, show you, I'll see if I can start the vehicle. It actually started, but it wouldn't, nothing happened. <laughs> and it, so, so that ended that. And I went, well, that's screwed up. And so I stepped back, and I look at this woman, and it was kind of a surreal thing. There's no, everything was quiet. She's standing there, these people that stopped with the two little children with the, were with this woman. And that woman's standing there, and we're all, nobody's saying anything. And this woman looks at the vehicle, and she turns around, and she says, Okay! I was trying to get to the airport, okay? And I fell asleep, and she started to weep. And it was, and people just looked at her. And it was, you know what I think? I'm reading this thing, and I think, you know, one day, I think there's some people that are going to say, Okay, Lord, I thought as soon as I retired, I was going to start, I thought I'd get involved in the work of God. I thought, Lord, as soon as I got out of debt. I, and I thought that I, I'd get serious about it. But time's up. Pen's down. Pen's down. It's too late to start doing that. And I say, you know what? A wise man, his heart will discern that if I'm going to get something done for God, I better get it done now. Because one of these days, it's going to be pen's down. Time. A wise man's heart will discern time. A time to row when the when the winds of doctrine start to blow, false doctrine, you're going to have to stand. You're going to have to say, "Listen, I'm not going to get blown off course. Whether it's me, my family, my church, a time to hold. You love someone, someone enough to pull them aside and say, "Listen, man, you need to make a decision here. A time to low. If you got family, maybe it's parents, children, whatever it is. Don't don't go back to Philistine country. Keep going, and a time to go." You better get it done while you can. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, uh, thank you, Lord, for, for Solomon, Lord. He had some wisdom, Lord. And, 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 Lord, we could get a hold and learn from his mistakes and recognize the end of life without obeying God is a wasted life. Father, I pray that there's somebody here that, uh, Lord, if they've been affected by this business of false doctrine, that they'll just, they, they won't passively listen to it and be affected by it in the wrong way. I pray the role. Pray, Father, if there's somebody here that's, uh, that, that sees someone that needs some direction, they won't just passively look at them and let them go the wrong way. And Lord, if there's uh, family here, that Lord, that, that we all have family somewhere, that they're not walking with you. And I pray, Lord, at the very least, we'll let them know, you know what, we love you, but we're going to keep going do God's way. And finally, Lord, if there's somebody here who's putting off living for Jesus that they'll get serious about it before he says it's done. And Father, if there's somebody here that's lost, that's not saved, doesn't know that for sure they're going to heaven, Lord, would they see that one of these days it'll be too late. They need to get saved. They need to trust you.